This is a practical expression of the meaning of the parable of the leaven that Jesus speaks about, in which he says the kingdom of God is like leaven. Now, leaven in the Hebrew mentality is the symbol of the unclean, as if Jesus said, well, what makes you think your judgment is correct? That's the question. And so it, it's an eternal question that rumbles down through the ages and needs to be looked at. In the case I'm about to describe, this was a physical disaster that I think almost any group of, any couple of parents would say, this is the worst thing that could ever happen to me. A child fell out of her hamper at 11 months and the back of her skull was so damaged that for the next 35 years of her life, she could never do anything at all for herself. In the first few years, she had to learn how to breathe because it was the back of the head where the vital functions are. So the parents spent hours dragging her through these exercises recommended by an expert that must have been very painful for this little child in order to help her to continue to live. And when finally she learned how to breathe a little bit, then they tried to teach her how to crawl. And so she had to go down through this hallway uh, every day as far as she could go. And so her parents would urge her on. And this took another two and a half hours every day of, of treatment. And finally, she just couldn't do it anymore. And she lay on her back and smiled at her father and wouldn't move. <laughs> Uh, this lady's name was Sarah Johnson, and uh, she comes from Snowmass. Uh, originally, they came from somewhere else. But Pat Johnson uh, was a uh, member of the Lama community, which is just up the road here in uh, above Taos. And it was there that I met her in the early 80s. And even then, this couple, her husband's name was Bob, were were taking care of this child in very primitive circumstances and living as part of an intentional community. And, and they invited me to give a intensive workshop at their Sufi intensive place, which I did the next year. And about 12 people joined me, and that was the first intensive prayer experience. My idea being that if Buddhists could benefit from five or six hours of meditation a day, maybe a few Christians might too. <laughs> and sure enough, they did. Very valuable to spend some time in solitude, especially if you have the help of a community. I don't recommend it every day, but, uh, but enough every day and once in a while to increase it. Well. Well, she liked that program so much that they moved the family up to Snowmass and began running the retreats that we still have at Snowmass, which are 10 days now with three or four hours of prayer every day input. And it's the same input, basically, that I gave at that original workshop. Now, Sarah, of course, went wherever they went. And so uh, when we began the retreats up there, she obviously had to come to the retreats. Pat was the cook, and so she laid her on the kitchen table where she would lie in humble splendor on a, on a you know, mat while all the retreatants would go about their business and Pat would cook lunch and so on. She never spoke, but once in a while something struck her funny and she would go into this ecstatic outcry which was almost a shriek or a whoop. I never saw anyone have such fun over it. Well, she, she was so appreciative anyone paid any attention to her, and I never saw her reject anyone. Uh, I, more and more, I'm convinced that she's the only person I ever met who had no false self. It was just at the moment the false self begins to function that she had this, in this, uh, 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 this incident. So because her family were capable of heroic love, God was able to have someone in the world who remained completely a child and childlike for the whole of her life. I, I think she's one of the most extraordinary persons that ever lived. 
All her meals, all her bodily needs had to be taken care of 24 hours a day. So we're talking about absolutely heroic devotion. Now you think that parents would, maybe some parents have to put her into, into uh, you know, some institution where she would certainly have died, you know, in a few years. Not this couple. It never occurred to them. They, they already had eight other children. So they're not unused to work. And that never seems to have been a problem for them. But this, this child became one of the principal persons of our staff. We had an excellent staff of people to talk to and give counseling, do the cooking, meals were superb. And everybody was turned on by the gorgeous, uh, well, location, and by attending a, a community of monks that are uh, sing the office, they, people like the liturgy. But the thing that impressed them the most in the retreat as the years went on was not us, but Sarah, because she perfectly embodied the essence of the retreat, which was to learn how just to be and to be completely open to anybody who came by. And some retreatants literally spent hours with her, just looking at her, and to look into her eyes, so limpid you'd think you'd be looking into the eyes of the Blessed Mother herself, or if you prefer, of God. <laughs> so her, some great credit is due to her siblings, because obviously she needed extraordinary care, and some of it must have been withdrawn from them. And so this accomplishment of having a complete paralytic become the star of a fairly sophisticated contemplative retreat house is, is a, is, was a community affair. It was the love of the parents primarily, but the love of the family and the sacrifices they made that made this extraordinary situation possible. Just to walk in there, the, the retreatants, the first thing they'd look for was Sarah when they would come for a retreat. And she's always delighted to see everybody. She had some uh, intelligence, and she certainly looked that way, but she never spoke she never could move easily, and she became more and more crippled and crumpled as the years went by and had to have a, her special chair, which the parents had to drive many miles to get. They got the best advice they could. Nothing could be done for her. Nothing was supposed to be done for her other than what happened, because she, without doing anything at all, without any effort at all, rose to ever-increasing admiration, power, strength, and service without even thinking about it. She just is, or was, because she's passed away. Well, as the years went by, her health gradually diminished. We live at several thousand feet in the air, about eight, so in the last year, she began to have a couple of crises of breathing. She would hyperventilate, they'd have to take her to the hospital, and the last year she spent on oxygen day and night. A further difficulty in the care. So, so the care we're talking about is, is 24 hours a day for 34 or 5 years. And she became the center of that household so that her friends and, and the children were wondering, how is mom and dad going to handle it when she eventually goes? Because she was their treasure, absolutely a treasure. Well, um, this winter uh, she had another serious attack and they had to take her to the hospital, and she began to hyperventilate for about three hours, and then gradually that subsided, and she breathed normally for a few moments, and then passed away. 
Her father scooped her up and came to Lama where they wanted to bury her. That's where they had lived as an intentional community. And they loved that place. It's on a hill up there beyond Taos. Well, this, it so happened, this was the teeth of winter and there had been a bad snowstorm. So they were worried about how they could bury her, but they didn't want to have her embalmed or anything like that. Actually, they brought her back for a night and laid her in her bed. And for 24 hours, she had on her face this charming little smile, like she had shown in life. So then they drove down, just with the family, to the Lama Foundation. And it so happened that Lama allows people who've been in the community or neighbors to be buried in their private cemetery. And they had dug a grave for this old neighbor who was 93 years old and in the hospital, expecting to die any day. Well, she got well <laughs> and went home. <laughs> so when they arrived there, this so the grave was already dug. All they had to do was to carry her down through the snow, which one of the former staff members carried her with great honor down there. And they sang songs and laid her there and had a great interaction with the community. Well, well, Bob, of course, her father, was absolutely devastated by her law. He knew he was going to, and he didn't know how he could ever face not having her. And... Uh, and, and Pat had the same crisis to go through, and we delicately raised the questions. What are you going to do when Sarah isn't here? He thought of how you're going to handle this. Well, we had a memorial service for her a month later, and at which Pat and Bob, uh, uh, at least Bob, spoke a few words. And on that occasion, he told us this story. It's about, uh, he said his grief was overwhelming. And on the night or two after he de her death, remembering her, her terrible struggle to breathe all her life, hyperventilation in the last, but really the cause of death, her collapsing lungs, he heard this little voice. It was very beautiful and sweet and belonged to a young woman. He had never heard it before. And the voice said, Dad, it's only one breath at a time. That's all she said. I think that's the best advice I have ever heard. The summary of all wisdom, <laughs> at least about the now. All you have to do is to take one breath at a time, no matter what happens. You don't have to think about how horrible the future will be or how you will handle it. So that's the program that I received from my major teacher and I'm trying to carry out. There's no past in this wisdom. There's no future. But there's an enormous presence to the present moment. All is in receiving what the breath symbolizes, namely the spirit. Moment by moment. And hence, whatever else is happening, you have to breathe. So this always goes on. Or in other words, God doesn't pass. You're always rooted in the ground of being, in the divine indwelling, in the Holy Spirit, who is the sacred breath, who is the kiss 
of the Father and the Son. So may that embrace be with us always, both now and whatever forever might be.